Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Vancouver, Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus Justin Gaethje, and Shaq is going down this Saturday in Canada. Two of the most exciting lightweights of all time are going to scrap in a main event showdown. I think the winner gets one step closer to a title shot. Yeah, 100%. Justin Gaethje, they don't call this guy the highlight for no reason. I mean, when he does fight, you know someone's going to sleep, guaranteed. And you can already go ahead and guarantee Justin Gaethje uh, 50K or his opponent 50K. You know what I'm saying? So... Uh, this guy is one of the most exciting fighters in the UFC in the UFC history in only about, what, five, six fights. So uh, Justin Gaethje is a legend. Cowboy Cerrone most wins in the UFC. I mean, look at the guy's resume. Wins over Eddie Alvarez, uh, Maya Kinta, Hernandez, Matt Brown. I mean, yeah. guy's got a, a serious resume. So it's going to be a great fight. Man, I'm so pumped, and what's so cool about it is that you got the all-time leaders in post-fight bonuses and Cowboy Cerrone taking on a guy in Justin Gaethje who is not only looking to beat that record, but he's only had five UFC fights. He already has six bonuses to his name, Shaq. Yeah, this guy's the bonus machine, and I think uh, Justin Gaethje has a point when he says that his pay should be uh, pretty much uh, the flat rate type, you know, because, I mean, he's basically saying that the 50K should already go ahead and, you know, be added into his contract. Yeah, I should already deposit that into his bank account. Uh, the guy puts it all on the line every single time for entertainment. It's going to be amazing, and I said the winner most likely moves up closer to a title shot, but, I mean, it might not even be a title shot. What about a big fight with Conor McGregor? Yeah, 100%, you know, if if Conor McGregor wants to uh, stop sitting on that 100 mil and actually, you know, come and fight, then, you know, there's nah. guys waiting on him. If he wants to stop putting that Irish powder in his <laughs> nose uh, and stop <laughs> punching old men at bars. If he wants to stop being Irish BJ Penn and hitting old men and not knocking them out, you know, uh, then there's guys waiting for him. I'll happily watch Gaethje or Cerrone uh, either chop down his legs or uh, make him tap for the fourth time. So... As far as this matchup, man, obviously Gaethje and Cerrone, two legends of the sport, two staples of the lightweight division. The winner's going to get one step closer. And, man, in the co-main event, they got the old versus the new because you got Glover Teixeira, the former number one contender. He's on a two-fight win streak, finished two young guys in a row, taking on Nikita Krylov, who appears to be finally putting things together. And in Nikita Krylov's 31 pro fights, he's never been the distance even one time, Shaq. Nikita's also another one of these killer-be-killed guys. They say he's he's putting it together with this one win over OSP, so it's going to be very interesting to see. We know what Glover's ground game has done to a lot of guys in the past, but we also been seeing Glover uh, wobble a little bit. My man, Glover, Glover's one of the true badasses in the sport man this guy's been around since like you know way you know prehistoric times man and he's uh still beating these young guys that you know you would think yeah i'm talking where the age gaps are 15 16 years you know what i'm saying and he's coming out here uh still finishing them so you know this fight with cry love should be uh pretty lit man they've been saying for a while that you know or they're saying now that glover's in his early 40s but if you know anything about those visa issues that he had back oh, in the day like 40, between 40, you and me he's in his late 40s early 50s because <laughs> Because I remember hearing about top prospect Glover Teixeira, but he could never get to the U.S. because of those visa issues. Even lost to Ed Herman on the regional scene. But boy, has he turned things around. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Glover Teixeira has fought for the title. I mean, that resume speaks for itself. And Nikita, like you said, all his fights... Uh, and inside the distance, I mean, one can either say Nikita's going to kill you or he's going to go on a suicide mission. <laughs> and w word on the street is Glover might have not only the most submissions in light heavyweight history, but the most finishes, at least tied with the great John Bones Jones. And real quick, we just want to give a shout out to Best Fight Pick sponsored athlete and Bellator number one featherweight contender, Emmanuel El Matador Sanchez, for going out there, handing the young undefeated prospect his first uh, L, taught the kid a serious lesson, whooped his ass. So in honor of Matador Sanchez's big win, Hashtag Million Dollar Manny. We know he's going to go out there and win that tournament. Use the promo code MATADOR to save 15% off any VIP package. Well, Shaq, let's break down this car start to finish, man, because first up in the lightweight division, we got Kyle Prepolek. He's 12-6, and six, and Austin Hubbard is 10-3. and three. Currently, they got Austin Hubbard minus 135. The comeback on Kyle Prepolek is plus 115. Well, interestingly enough, Shaq, when Justin Gaethje fought James Vick, he called James Vick a bitch-ass point fighter. And in the gym, you know, Justin Gaethje, he's got guys like Drew Dober. He's got guys like Alex White. You know those guys are going out there. They're standing and banging all their rounds. Uh, the whole gym stops to watch them spar. But for that James Vick fight, 
Justin said, I need a bitch-ass point fighter to emulate him. He brought in Austin Hubbard. Do you think Austin Hubbard gets his first UFC win here against the Canadian cop Repolik? Yeah, you know, Hubbard comes from that team elevation camp. You know, I think he's roommates with Curtis Blades, who top three heavyweights. So he's he's surrounded by a great fighter. So, you know, he I'm sure he's the one taking the lumps in the gym still, you know. But this guy is a former LFA champion. You cannot deny him that, right? I mean, he won, you know, the biggest regional uh, promotion title out there. So, And then you got Kyle Prepolik, on the other hand, who was kind of bought in on a short notice there's there, you know he was gonna fight mike santiago on the local scene a, a ufc reject and you know he if he won that fight maybe he probably gets in but who's to say he would have won i mean this guy prepper like uh he generally loses the guys you know uh that go to the ufc like troy lamps and like kevin lee like alex ricci <laughs> <laughs> you lost to alex ricci you guys <laughs> true story but uh i think that uh this fight as far as a betting perspective is is interesting to see everyone coming on prepper like but you know, I, I understand Austin Hubbard isn't the most dangerous guy. He does, in a lot of his fights, take a upfront ass open and then end up having to come back when his opponents are gassed. I would say that's the kind of fighter I would classify Hubbard as. He He's a guy that kind of capitalizes on guys that are a little tired. But, I mean, when you look at his last two wins, Harvey Park, you know, that was a, I don't want to say it was, I mean, it was a very close fight. But I'll just put it this way. Pat Militech scored it for Harvey Park. And, you know, I kind of did too as well, but it was very close. It could have won either way. Way. But Austin Hubbard's problem is he backs up too much. Sometimes he doesn't engage. Sometimes he shies away from the exchange. Other than that, he's fundamentally just average, solid, good grappling. He did just beat an 11 0 uh, Brazilian guy that Glover Teixeira was cornering. But it's funny because he got, you know, if you actually watch that fight, Kalis Mata had him in a rear naked choke to end the round, and the referee actually stopped it. But then uh, Hubbard woke up. You know, instantly kind of doing the Kiesa, the uh, the Chas Kelly, like no, 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 I'm good. Uh, you know, Robbie Lawler and the ref uh, let it continue. The guy, the, the Brazilian, was on the stage celebrating. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> thinking the fight was over, they had to come and get him down and shit. <laughs> get off the cage, young get man. Off the cage, sir. And uh, he completely gassed out. After Glover that. was furious. Yeah, Glover and them were throwing a temper tantrum. They were cussing the ref out the entire time. And rightfully so. <laughs> and uh, the Brazilian gassed out and. Um, and Austin Hubbard was able to just control him on the mat, land uh, punches and bunches. So, you know, I feel like Kyle Prepolek, he's just an average, average guy. You know, he's a tough guy. I do A part of me do feels like he may be a little tougher than, uh, than Austin Hubbard. But just overall skill department, I just think Austin Hubbard is just knows how to put it uh, together better. And he's done it against better competition as where Prepolek... You know, he's been fighting, he's fought UFC vets, good prospects, but I've seen him in fights where Cody against Cody Fister, you know, another UFC reject. Uh, and, uh, I mean, he was getting taken out at well, and I've seen Hubbard use a similar game plan. So I'm going to go against the public. I'm going to take Austin Hubbard by 29-28, controversial decision in Canada. Yeah, man, I think this is kind of a tough fight to call because Austin Hubbard, you know, we mentioned he, he is a bit of a point fighter, very underwhelming. You know, we went out there and parlayed Davi Hamosh that last fight. A lot of people were saying Hubbard was a live dog. We disagreed all the way. And I'll tell you what, you know, I thought it was going to be one takedown. The fight will be over shortly after. But, I mean, he still got his ass beat, but he at least defended the submissions and made it all the way to a decision. So props to him. But, man, his last three fights, I know it says he's won two of his last three. Between you and me, he's lost three of his last three because Harvey Park got robbed. Kylie Smoda submitted him, and Davi Ramos uh, gave him a tour of the octagon. So in my opinion, Austin Hubbard's on a three-fight skid. And with Kyle Prepolek, the only reason he got the call is because C.R. Bahadurzada pulled out of the Nordin fight. They needed a local Canadian come in and get this ass whooping. That's exactly what happened. But man, here against Austin Hubbard, at least he's fighting in his normal weight class. And he's not fighting a very dangerous guy. And he's got the home field advantage. So even if Austin Hubbard goes out here and edges him, I still think the judges are going to give it to Kyle Prepolek unless it's such a wide margin that you know you, can, uh, you can't give it to the, lo to the local guy. But that being said, I think they will give it to the local guy. I'm going Kyle Prepolek here via close decision. Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got Luis Smolka. He's 15-6. and six, And Ryan Main Event McDonald is 10-1. Currently, they got Luis Smolka minus 235. The comeback on Ryan McDonald is plus 195. Well, Shaq, anytime you see a minus 23 something next to Luis Smolka's name, you got a question. Uh, what, what kind of level of opposition is he going up against? Well, now it's uh, my boy Ryan Main Event McDonald. What kind of chance you give the underdog here? Luis Smolka, I've been hard on him in the past, but to be honest, man, I think he just ran into a case his last fight of running in the match Schnell. I mean, Schnell's out here fucking put. Schnell's about to fight Pantoja, you know what I'm saying? Schnell's been out here running through guys. Man, he's seems like he's uh, been putting it together. I mean, he ran through 
Smoka and uh, Espinosa very quickly. Same method. Yeah, <laughs> trying to show <laughs> very quickly. And, I mean, uh, Schnell's been looking good, man. So, uh, you know, he did was coming off one against Sumajari. Brian McDonald's one of these cases of when you watch the tape before his UFC debut, I mean... My, even in his UFC debut. I mean, this guy really didn't have much competition against opponents with running records. Um, you know, we've seen him get floored by, you know, seven and nine guys. You know, that just shows you the caliber of fighter he really is. I mean, it just wasn't very impressive. I mean, the guy's slow, not very athletic, doesn't really, not really good in any skill set per se. I mean, he's just a tough kid that was fighting uh, on the Nebraskan local scene. You know what I'm saying? So, now he's uh, coming in here, his second UFC fight. I'm sure he's gotten a lot better. That ass whooping from Gutierrez uh, made him go home and was like, God damn, you know what I'm saying? But personally, man, this line, one could say it's a little inflated, but when you really look at the guys that Smoka loses to, man, those guys are all talented. You know, those guys are a hundred times better than Ryan McDonald. I'm talking about guys like Mateus Nicolau. I'm talking about guys like Ray Borg or... We'll leave uh, Chris Carriasso out of that conversation, huh? Chris Curry also fought for a UFC title. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, you know all those guys are ranked fighters that he lose that he lost to. Now, granted, those were at a different weight class. He's at 135 pounds. If Luis can get on top of this guy, I feel like uh, his grappling is going to be a little bit too much. And on the feet, McDonald I would say that he could possibly get the better of a guy like Smoker. But I've seen the guy get dropped by dropped by Jobber, so I wouldn't be shocked if Luis came out here and uh, had one of his. Classic little Hawaiian hood performances where he beat the guy's ass. So I'm going to go with Luis Smoka by second round submission. Yeah, you know, initially when the line came out, I was like, yo, it's almost 2-1 to one to fade Smoka. But then you watch Ryan main event McDonald. And firstly, I want to give him a shout out because I heard one of his interviews. Seems like a really nice kid. Seems like a lifelong martial artist. It's just that when you're at this level in the UFC, there's small margin for error. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter how nice of a kid you are. It matters how well you can fight at the highest level. And simply put, I think Ryan McDonald needs a little bit more seasoning before he's on this level. But luckily for him, he's taking on a guy in Smolka who, even though Smolka is extremely tough, he's Hawaiian, he's durable, he's very game planable, and he, his style hasn't really changed since he's been in the UFC. It's the same thing. So there definitely is a path to beat him. It's just I don't think Ryan McDonald's on that level right now. So what I think is even though there might be some back-and-forth scrambles, they, I mean, this, the upset's not going to surprise me one bit. This is Lewis Smolka we're talking about, but I still think he's on a higher level than McDonald. I think he gets on top of him, pounds him out. I'm going Lewis Smolka for the victory. Next up in the featherweight division, we got Chaz the Scrapper Skelly. He's 17-4, and four, and Jordan Griffin is 17-6. and six. Currently, they got Jordan Griffin minus 140, the comeback on Chaz the Scrapper Skelly is plus 110. Well, Shaq, this initially opened as a pick -em with a lean on Chaz the Scrapper Skelly. Now it's Jordan Griffin who's favorite here. So are you going with the Rufus Sport Striker or are you going with uh, Chaz the Scrapper Skelly to extend the record for most submissions in featherweight history? Got a lot of friends at Rufus Sport and, you know, Chaz is a, Chaz is a nice buddy of mine. So, you know, this is going to be a good fight. Griffin, Rufus Sport's been high, right, been high recently, man, except uh, Showtime Pettis. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Griffin, uh, he's one of these guys that Look, he's a very he fights with a lot of spirit. He's a Native American. He, he will fight you. The issue with Jordan Griffin throughout his whole career has been this guy is always fighting off takedowns. I mean, this guy is always sprawling on the fence, and he's just one of those guys that continuously finds himself in you know position to get hugged on and leaned on. And you know we know that Chaz Skelly is a is a good grappler. I'm not sure uh, what his uh, jujitsu rank is, but uh, Chaz. Yeah. Purple belt, but I know he's, got a, I know he's got a, a, a lot of funky uh, grappling techniques that we've seen in the past. And the knock on Chas Kelly is, you know, the first round, guys swinging heavy, got good back takes, probably will take your back in that first round. The thing is, if you survive that, it seems like he slows down and runs himself into the ground a little bit. And if you do that with a guy like Jordan Griffin, like I said earlier, he fights with a lot of spirit. He will fight you. He will make you fight for three rounds. This could be, I feel like it is a pick and fight because I feel like this guy Griffin, I've seen him get tapped out by Dan Moret in the past and although those were a long time ago it just seems like he still has the same issues but I do you know have a, a feeling that Chaz you know is on a little bit of a decline since he had that Tommy John surgery um and he is getting a little bit older you know so I feel like it's a pick em fight you know I feel like a lot of people would think Griffin's gonna run away with this but I don't know you gotta see the improvements he made he did fight Ige and Ige's been uh Ige's been running through dudes and I'll tell you what he fought Ige better than a lot of people you know what I'm saying he wasn't uh wobbling all over the cage 
So I'm going to go with Griffin. I think uh, it, it could possibly be a very close fight if he continues to make these little grappling uh, mistakes. But at the, same, at the end of the day, as a betting perspective, you know, we got the number 48 uh, featherweight as a dog to the number 91, you know, featherweight. Uh, although the number 91 featherweight's a little younger, the grappling of Chaz Skelly might be a little bit too much. Yeah, I'm going to just let you all know I'm really biased. Uh, Chas Kelly is a friend of mine. I'm not going to pick against him. But as far as where he could capitalize on Jordan Griffin's weaknesses, Jordan Griffin gets taken down almost every single fight. So Chas Kelly, use that NAIA wrestling, that jujitsu purple belt. Go out there, tap this guy. Uh, I'm going Chas Kelly via submission. I think he breaks the record for most submissions in UFC featherweight history. Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got Brad Katona. He's 8-1, and one, and Hunter Azure is 7-0. Currently, they got Brad Katona, minus 165. The comeback on Hunter Azure is plus 145. Well, Shaq, this is an interesting matchup because you got the ultimate fighter winner, Brad Katona. He's favored here. He's taken on a very highly credentialed wrestler in Hunter Azure. And word on the street is Hunter Azure could have been a D1 wrestler in college, but he opted to pursue this life of MMA instead, made this his full-time gig. One on Contender Series, actually went the distance. Dana still gave him a contract. Now he's making his UFC debut against uh, the SBG product, Brad Katona. Which way you lean him? This is an interesting fight because Katona, he's one of these guys where I feel like he might be a little undersized for, for Bantamweight. And as crazy as that sounds, he's got wins over featherweights like Bryce Mitchell from Tough. And Katona is one of these guys where I feel like he's a very smart kid. I feel like he's very skilled too. It's just, it just seems like his weakness is he gets taken down by much stronger guys and he struggles to get up. Now, granted, that, that was against the only time he actually lost. It was granted against Marab Davishvili, who's a takedown machine, a guy. His nickname is the machine now, you know what I'm saying? Marab dumps people whenever he wants. I mean, I saw Bryce Mitchell trained with Marab and he said that Marab dumped him on his head like 11 times, you know what I'm saying? So I'm interested to see the if Cantona's made any improvements after that loss because I, 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 I think he's a smart kid in comparison to Hunter Azu, in terms of overall MMA skills, I think he's a little bit more far along than Hunter Azur. You know, Hunter Azur just turned pro recently. I think uh, Hunter Azur is a big, strong athlete. He's got the tools to win this fight in terms of getting the takedowns. But the thing is, I've, I've never actually seen him grind someone out for three rounds, at least against anyone good. You know what I'm saying? The guy Chris Okan, he fought on uh, Contender Series, you know, is a, is a nice guy. But when you look at his resume, it was a, I don't want to say a tailor-made fight Three for him. Four exactly. <laughs> it was a tailor-made fight for Azur to win. Now, this could possibly be another version of that. My only concern with Azur is, you know, is, is his chin. You know, uh, I've seen the guy get floored by, you know, six and four guys on the local scene, uh, you know, multiple times, although those guys are swinging. You know, I just don't like seeing UFC caliber fighters, supposedly UFC caliber fighters, putting themselves in positions against bums like that because it'll come back out to light later in the future, guaranteed. Hunter Azur, he's, got, he's big, strong, got the size, so I do think he's more alive than not. But uh, I think that Katona might make some improvements off the wrestling, come back a little bit better. I don't want to necessarily write the kid off just because he got taken down by a guy who takes down pretty much everyone. I don't think Hunter Azur is on that level level as a overall MMA fighter. I think he's got the recipe to win, but I'll go with Brad Katona by uh, late submission. Yeah, Brad Katona definitely seems like a smart kid, and he's got to be in this spot because if not, his weakness is going to get exposed once again. I mean, you watch that fight with Matthew Lopez, he got taken down four times. You watch that fight with Mirab Divalishvili, he got taken down five times. So here, against the Montana State wrestler, how many times is he going to get taken down? That's the big question. And if he does get taken down, will he get back up? Will he try to go for his jujitsu? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and interestingly enough, I heard Brad Katona did six weeks at Penn State for this camp, you know, try to sharpen up that wrestling. Now, six weeks ain't going to make up for a lifetime of wrestling. I'll tell you that much right now. But maybe he did get some good techniques to, you know, neutralize the attack of a Hunter Azure, keep this fight standing, or set up his submissions off his back. One thing about Katona, he loves to fight off his back, and this hits the scorecards. That's not a good thing. But at the same time, Azure leaves his arm in there, leaves a neck in there. It could get taken home. So Azure's got to be very careful. And also, Azure's chin, like Shaq mentioned, is definitely in question, man. The fight before Contender Series, I mean, I don't know what the deal was. Maybe there was a lot of pressure on him. I know that he got a Contender Series offer prior to that, and he said, no, I want more experience. Let me take one more fight, and then I'll come to Contender Series. Maybe there was a lot of pressure on him, but bottom line, you should not be getting floored multiple times by that guy that he did. And that fight was only a couple days after Katona fought Mirab. So 
at least uh, Azure's fought twice since the last time Katona's fought, you know, because every single time Azure fights, he's going to get more experience. That's the thing. He's very young in his career. And he's got some physical attributes here on Katona, man. Obviously, the height advantage, but more importantly, the five inch reach advantage and just the wrestling background, the physicality. Whereas I think that Hunter Azure might be finishing his career at Featherweight and Katona might be finishing his career at Flyweight. So I do think the size difference is going to be a factor. It's just about is Hunter Azure mature enough? for this level of competition yet because we saw the deal two fights ago so as long as he levels up he i mean that's the bottom line in this time off he's had to have leveled up and if he has i think he comes out here and gets the win but it's contingent on being a being a new man than the last time we saw hunter azure for the win next up in the bantamweight division we got miles johns he's nine and zero, and cole smith is seven and zero. currently they got miles johns minus 130 the comeback on Cole Smith is plus 110. Well, Shaq, you got a very tall bantamweight in Cole Smith. He won his UFC debut. Now he's taking on Miles Johns, who not only trains out of Fortis MMA, but just got a contract on Dana White Contender Series. Who do you think uh, gets another win here? This fight's going to be really interesting. Cole Smith said that he would happen to actually be in Vegas, and he actually happened to be at the Contender Series show uh, the same night that Miles Johns was fighting. And he just said that he had a coincidence that maybe he... Uh, and maybe the two of them would be fighting, and that's exactly what happened. So he's been uh, he's been ready for this fight now. Miles John, one of these uh, big, strong Fortis MMA athletes, and my boy Safe Saud. I mean, that guy has been out here changing dudes' lives. I mean, the guy uh, <laughs> got Carlos Diego to stand with Maribek Tysonov in the pocket for three rounds, and uh, absolutely Molly whop him all over the cage. So. Uh, Safe Sayu might be coach of the year out here in these streets, man. And then, you know, my boy Captain might have a yeah. Captain might have something to say about that, Eric Albertine. But you know, man, hey, Safe. Uh, I mean, he's changed. He changed Span into something. He changed uh, a lot of guys. Into Jeff something. Neal. Jeff Neal. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, Miles John definitely has the size and strength over a guy like Cole Smith, who's much more of a logger, uh, bantamweight, five eleven. Cole's a guy that likes to throw a lot of calf kicks, keep his range, and you know, look to take that back. And when he gets that back in that body triangle, he seems to either get his rear naked choke or just control you. Now, Miles Johns was minus a thousand in his uh, contender series fight against Richie Santiago. Was it a minus thousand performance? You know, he did beat his ass. It was thirty twenty six. But you know, there was times where you know, in some grappling situations where you could see that a, a big muscular short stocky guy you know 5'7 135 like uh miles johns with the 66 inch reach with all that muscle in his frame he gets a little tired you know big big muscly guys like that they need a break you know they they need to rest and against a guy like cole unlike richie santiago where he could just scramble out of some of those positions because richie santiago was bought in to lose you know uh cole smith could do a little uh, a lot better than that but the thing with cole smith is we saw in that third round against Mitch Gagnon that he did a massive chicken dance but he recovered very well but he's got to be careful of that because John's early on in this fight is going to be throwing some serious haymakers at his chin and he's got to weather the storm and get this big muscly guy in the late rounds and then uh take him down and gas him out because we saw he, he made he made some uh, grappling mistakes against Richie Santiago he gave up his back once he you know just went 250 50 in a couple positions so if you got Cole Smith at that at that uh plus 140 you know range you know I feel like it's a very good bet it's interesting to see a lot of people around him everyone's going against Johns he is in, a, in Canada his hometown so I am gonna pick Cole Smith but I am a little skeptical now because I feel like Johns could show up a little bit better and there's a chance that he closes this distance on Cole and does touch his chin. But I'll go with Cole Smith. I feel like right now he's the better overall fighter. And uh, this would be a, a, a good time to catch Johns. He's still probably thinking he's a little invincible and uh, etc. It's going to be a very good fight between two Bantamweight prospects, two guys that kind of represent some of the new school Bantamweights. I mean, not often you see guys that are five foot eleven at 135 pounds. That's exactly what you got with Cole Smith. And I hear the narrative, everyone's talking about how he got dropped by Mitch Gagnon, but they're conveniently leaving out that he dominated 14 minutes and 52 seconds of that fight, and that he recovered right away and short and took the guys back shortly after. So I was really impressed with Cole Smith's fight. As far as Miles John's fight, I definitely see the potential for sure, man. I think that his finished product is going to be serious. I just think that he had to go out there, iron out some of the kinks, and you know work on some things big pressure situation but even though this is his ufc debut i actually think the pressure is on cole smith here home country home crowd miles johns uh even though he's the favorite 
You know, it's uh, all the action's been coming in on Cole Smith, and I was more impressed with Cole Smith uh, when I watched the tape, but I think stylistically, Miles Johns might have the style to come out here and neutralize him and win that decision. So I'm actually going to go with Miles Johns here. I think he'll be the more physical guy, win the decision. Next up in the heavyweight division, we got Marcin Tibor Tibora. He's 17 and 5, and Augusto Sakai is 13 and 1. Currently, they got Marcin Tibora, minus 120. The comeback on Augusto Sakai is plus 100. Well, Shaq, we all remember the heart attack Marcin Tibora gave me uh, when it was supposed to be easy money over there in Singapore, 5 a.m. You know, my boy John Tuck already took care of Gomi in under a minute. Now it's uh, Marcin. Let's go take care of Andre. Let's go back to sleep. Wake up with two max bets cashed. And uh, second round, Marcin tried to literally pull a stun. I know everyone's saying that. Augusto robbed Andre Arlovsky, but let's not forget what happened when Marcin Tibura fought Andre Arlovsky. So now my question is, these two heavyweights meet here in Canada. Who do you think uh, takes the next step up the ladder? A few years ago, Marcin Tibura was supposed to be a top prospect. He uh, beat Andre Arlovsky, then they gave him that five-rounder against Verdum. Somewhat of a spirited effort, he went the entire five rounds when he was the big underdog. So after that fight, we were saying, oh, you know, Tibera is gonna, gonna be making improvements now. He's got a lot of confidence, but it's been com the, the complete opposite. Ever since he fought Fabricio Verdum, he got matched up with Derek Black, Beast Lewis, and he was up two rounds, but he was probably one to one. But just the fact that Lewis literally gave him every opportunity. He kept flopping to his back over and over again. You had full mount in both rounds. You know what I'm saying? And the fa and it, it just seems like guys pick up on his rhythm too easily. It seems like he's caught out here trying to fight like a, a bantamweight when he's a heavyweight. This little head movement in his in his uh, push kicks. And you know he's he's got some good high kicks and you know some good jujitsu. But I just think that the guy's confidence is completely shot. We're not dealing with the 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 guy that was entering the UFC and even the guy that was entering in the UFC wasn't shit either I mean they fucking beat uh Victor Pesta and and uh Enrique and Luis and, and Enrique De Silva <laughs> like you know what I'm saying but uh, both UFC rejects and he got the Andre Arlovsky win after Andre had already been uh, finished like four times in a row. I mean, just put it this way. Marcin gave Mar uh, Andre the confidence to keep going. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that Marcin Tabura was a fraud this entire time. I, I respect the guy. But now in this matchup with Augusto Sakai, I think he's in big trouble. You know, I feel like Augusto Sakai is one of these new breed of heavyweights. He's coming in off the Contender Series Brazil. But he's got high-level experience. I mean, he fought Czech Congo and Bellator. You know, he's been on those big shows before they just uh released them too prematurely and uh i think it's because the congo fight was congo you know congo did one of those i mean they did the same shit they released volkov too <laughs> yeah, exactly. and now we got a main event fighter <laughs> thanks bellator thanks belly but uh you know i think that uh you're gonna see sakai kind of go on a similar path here you know i feel like sakai has better cardio than tybora tybora has been huffing and puffing his last fight against shamil abdurahimov he was uh leaving the the exits, I mean, just with his chin. The Arlovsky fight was all I needed to see. <laughs> his chin straight up in the air. Uh, the Struve fight, I mean, look, Struve it was on his way to retirement. Now he's coming back, but it was a good, it was a good time. Point blank, I just think Marcin Tabura was overrated the entire time. And now this fight with Sakai, he's fighting a guy that he beat Andre Arlovsky in his second UFC fight. That's a very, you know, we can say Andre loses this and that, but... Junior it. Albini lost in his second <laughs> UFC fight. It, uh, this, and, and this was... Uh, uh, and I like the way he put pressure on him. You know, people are saying that was a robbery. I, I don't get how. I mean, he walked him down. It's because the they bet on Arlovsky. <laughs> he bet on him. The, he walked him down the entire time. And that's against a guy in Arlovsky who weighs like 30 pounds less than Sakai. Arlovsky's going to have a big speed advantage in a fight like that. Now he's fighting a guy a little heavier, a guy that already guys pick up on his rhythm very easily, a guy who he just seems out of it. He doesn't have that same confidence. I think his confidence is completely shot after the Shamil KO. I mean, he took it. He didn't take a seat. I mean, he didn't know where he was. I mean, he was completely out of it. It's a good time. Dog money, uh, you know, I feel like it's definitely Sakai or pass, and I think Sakai will knock uh, Marcin Tibura out. Yeah, look, Marcin Tibura, I remember when he made his UFC debut against Tim Johnson, everyone was betting Marcin Tibura, and I didn't quite get it. I actually went out there and bet Tim Johnson, came through, but then his next two fights, he went out there and won. I kind of thought, okay, maybe this is what everyone was talking about. Maybe this is that heavyweight prospect goes in there against Arlovsky. Like I already told you guys, 5 a.m. in Singapore. We're supposed to, you know, let's, let's just knock out Andre real quick, who's on a five-fight losing streak, and, you know, move on uh, to bigger, better things. And 
in that second round, I mean, if Andre wasn't as, you know, if Andre wasn't on a five fight skate, if Andre had, you know, any kind of youth in him, he would have put Tybora out so quick. But I mean, you guys need to see the kind of stunt Tybora pulled in that second round because it was unlike anything I've ever seen before in my life. Like, like I told you already, I bet on Tuck to beat Gomi, submitted him the first time the fight hit the mat under 40 seconds. That's exactly what, what uh, Tybora was supposed to do. Hit the guy one time, let's go home. And you know what I'm saying? That kind of display, to be huffing and puffing like that against Arlovsky, I just, uh, I've never been sold on Tybora. And since that point, got completely outclassed by Wardoom, got knocked out by a Black Beast, almost tried to pull a stunt against Stefan Sarubi, got rocked with that front kick to the face. Next fight gets knocked out by a point fighter. So I think uh, Marcin Tybora's confidence is shot. I think his chin is completely shot. I think he gets knocked out here by a guy at Sakai who has real Muay Thai, first of all. You know, when people see Sakai, they think, oh, he's just some random fat guy. And if that's what you think, uh, you might be in for a big surprise when this guy's going out here parrying every single thing that Marcin throws at him. Gets his head off that center line, slips and rips, counters. I think uh, Augusto Sakai comes out here and knocks out Marcin Tibor on the first round. Next up in the light heavyweight division, we got Misha Sarkunov. He's 14-5, and five, and Jimmy the Brute Crute is 10-0. Currently, they got Misha Sirkunov minus 115. The comeback on Jim Crute is minus 105. So currently, it's a pick em with a slight lead on Sirkunov. Initially, Jim Crute opened a minus 145 favorite. So all the action has been coming in on the guy who has been brutally knocked out in the first round in three of his last four fights. Granted, this is a big step up in competition. Do you think the line is justified here? It's an interesting fight. You know, you got Jimmy Crute, a very young kid, 23 years old, against Misha Sirkunov. Now, guys, just for past references, right now, you can... I'll go back to... I believe it might have been in Canada, too. Dos Anjos versus Lawler. All right, so guys, just start at... Uh, go back, type in best fight picks. Lawler versus Dos Anjos. Skip to uh, Misha Serkinov versus Glover Breakdown. Then, then go to UFC 235. Jones versus Smith. Listen to uh, that Misha Serkinov breakdown. And now I'm about to give you my breakdown right now. So <laughs> Misha Serkinov, very nice guy. Big, strong black belt. Finished Nikita Krylov by submission. Uh, beat Jan, a 21-year-old Jan Kudalaba by submission. I mean, initially coming right off the mat, Misha was supposed to be this big-time prospect. I know they signed him to that fat deal. No, he's getting he's getting paid. <laughs> and, uh, and things just seem like it seemed like when he stepped up in competition, he's uh, completely just falling off a little bit. Now, I've been on record to say that Misha Serkinov is a guy where you put this guy in one bad spot, go back and listen to those previous breakdowns, he will fold and he will cover up up and possibly go face first in the mat now granted is jimmy crude on the on the same le level of athleticism as a as a johnny walker no we know that johnny did hit him with the knee from uh from hell but now he's coming off that prior to that he was coming off two uh ko losses one by vulcan ozdemir in which he he, he charged that ozdemir and he got hit one time on the ear and went down you know, face first in the mat. Then he fought Glover Teixeira. It seemed like he was picking old-ass Glover Teixeira apart, and he was hurting him, and then he started, he ate one right hand, and it just seemed like progressively he started getting more desperate, started letting more stuff go, and then he found himself in position to get taken down, and the black belt that Misha Serkinov is gave up and let go of his wizard and just didn't get up. He just stood there and got smashed on eventually. Smashed on for a TKO win, and he got a fight against Pat Cummins, who shouldn't be fighting. No, Pat Cummins beat Carlos Jr. and, and Jan Blakovich and <laughs> John Volante uh, and Blakovich, you know what I'm saying? Uh, he's got some wins, but... <laughs> You know, I think that uh, their fight, no no punches to the face got thrown. I mean, <laughs> Pat Cummins shouldn't be fighting. So then he gets to fight with Johnny Walker, and it gets finished in, what, less than a minute? Um, so I feel like Misha Serkinov's confidence is, a, is definitely down. He's definitely coming to fight, but I just still feel like... I'm going to still go ahead and see it. You really put this guy in one bad spot. I mean, that's a, a shot on the ear, a shot on the chin, stuffing his takedowns. You know what I'm saying? He will slowly start to break. This is just facts. This has been the case since the since day one. He just didn't have the opponents that could do it. You know, none of those opponents had any uh, composure. So now that we saw him step up in competition, we've been seeing what I've been saying from day one. So now in this fight with Jim Crew, Jim Crew's a young kid. Def definitely a big step up for Jim Crew. I will say this ain't Alvi or uh, Paul Craig anymore. Misha would definitely probably finish both of those guys as well. The thing with Jim Crew is he's so young and he's already this good, guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Imagine how it's going to be now. Is How long is it, How long has it been since the Alvi fight? Uh, six months or six, so. Six months or and some change. And now he's done this entire camp with Robert Whitaker as he's preparing, preparing for this fight with Israel Adesanya. He's got the right people around him. He's 
he's are he's only 23 years old and he's out here finishing guys like Sam Alvey. Now I wasn't high on him after the Craig fight. I bet on him in the Craig fight. Now you know I was like, man, this guy's getting taken out by Paul Craig. Paul Craig's a joke, but Paul Craig and Misha Serkinov got two completely different grappling styles. Paul Craig is a very is a trickster. You know he likes to, and his shots are way faster too. You know what I'm saying? He and Misha's more of a he likes to stand a little bit. You know he likes to drop you first and then look for submissions or you try to take him down like uh, Nikita Krylov. You know what I'm saying? So this is a good fight for Jimmy. The public's got this one wrong. I feel like they're setting Misha Serkinov up for Jim Crute to get into the top 15. Jim Crute's one of their guys. Let me think about it, guys. He fought. They bought him from Australia to, to, to contender series. He was probably one of the first ones to do that. And he looks sluggish in that fight. That's a long fight from Australia. He finishes Paul Craig when Ankalaev and Kennedy couldn't, you know, finish him either. And those guys, uh, although Jimmy put himself in bad positions, I mean, at the end of the day, Paul Craig got finished and he got fucked up. You know what I'm saying? And so I think Jimmy Crute's got the mindset. I think that he says all the right things i feel like a typical young guy might be looking to ahead here might be thinking this is already in the bag but not jimmy Crute, man i feel like he's got his head on straight misha Serkinov, they come out here stand out in space misha's probably gonna try to bum rush him with some shots and i just feel like even if misha did get on top of jim crew i feel like jim crew's a isn't he's a black belt in jujitsu you know what i'm saying i'm not convinced that misha just passes his guard and gets an arm triangle i feel that uh jimmy crew can work uh, his way back up to the feet and if he makes this a dog fight what do dog fights consist of? Bad spots. And what did I say? If what happens when you put Misha Serkinov in a bad spot? He will fold. So I got Jim Crute. And I actually got Jim Crute by late first round knockout. You know, I feel like Misha Serkinov is probably going to come with a, a hard, hard tie up. Probably try to get him to the ground. But I feel like when that doesn't work, and I feel like it's probably going to be towards late the first round, I'm going to hit him with a right high kick or a overhand right or something like something, something on his chin. And, uh, you know, that'll be that. But I got Jimmy Crude. I feel like uh, the value's on him here. Yeah, Misha Serkinov is a very interesting guy. We've had a lot of choice uh, words and opinions about him in the past, and that's not going to stop here, man, because... I've known about Misha Serkunov since before he was in the UFC. You know, uh, my neighbor, Tex Johnson, he'll hook this guy in under two minutes. You know what I'm saying? So he's already been getting finished outside the UFC. Then he comes to the UFC, and I see a lot of people comparing this to the Jan Kutalaba fight. And Jimmy Crew and Jan Kutalaba fight nothing alike, first of all. Second of all, Jimmy Crew is a black belt in jiu-jitsu under the Machado brothers. And when you look at this guy's picture of him getting promoted, and you've got the Machado brothers in that picture, first of all, if you know anything about jujitsu, you know that, uh, first of all, black belts ain't just getting handed out. You know, we're not talking about a Cub Swanson, uh, you know, put a 25 cents in the in the machine at the grocery store and get your black belt or get your cereal box off the counter, open it up and get the black belt or go to Amazon and get your black belt. That's not the case with Jimmy Crute. In his promotion picture, the Machado brothers are there vouching for him. If you got the Machado brothers vouching for you saying you're a legit black belt, that means you're a legit black belt. So that's all I got to say about that because I know the whole thing is, well, Paul Craig took this guy down. Yeah, let's completely ignore that Paul Craig double-legged the Russian too. Let's completely ignore that Paul Craig finished the Nigerian too. So I just don't see why him uh, you know, taking down Jim Crude is such a big deal. That's what the guy does. He takes people down, except he took down the Russian and finished him. He took down the Nigerian and finished him. Well, guess what happened when he fought the Australian? He got submitted, okay? So uh, let's just get that out the way real quick. Now, look, as far as Misha Serkunov, I mean, the guy's a beast. When you talk about what the output and physically speaking, the guy's a monster. I mean, he's got he's got the physical attributes. He hits like a truck. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Decent wrestling, really physical guy. Very, very scary guy. Like, you got to respect that. It's just that, you know, we talk about the famous Floyd Mayweather quote, he can give it, but can he take it too? No, he cannot take it too. Not only can he not take it, I mean, his chin is completely shot, but his confidence, man, he don't believe in himself at all. I mean, we're at the point now where, you know, it used to be one of those things where, you know, all his Canadian fans were like, man, he's so talented, but he needs to move out of his small gym in Canada. And then it was like, then he's in Vegas. Now he's still getting knocked out in the first round every fight. And then it's like, well, now the guy, uh, now now it's time to do some virtual reality. I mean, the guy is so desperate that, you know, he's playing video games to do training. I, I, I just think that Jimmy the Brute Crew is with the right people here. He's training with Robert Whitaker's people because, you know, Sam Greco, his coach, was going through an open heart surgery. We we wish you the best, Sam. Hope you get better soon. His jiu-jitsu coach, Stewie Molden, was also going through some things. So he's doing this whole camp. He's doing a champ camp for this fight. And also, if you know about the light heavyweight division, if you, if you kind of sit down and analyze the matchups that are going down, the UFC are in a process of out with the old and in with the new. And this is one of those matchups right there. They're trying to set up Misha Serkinov, get Jim Crute that number 15 spot. So 
even though Misha might take him down, I think that Jim Crute does get back up. And when it's Jim Crute's time to return, I think that's when the fight will be over, man. I think he knocks out Misha Serkunov probably in the first round. And next up in the middleweight division, we got Antonio Cara de Sapach, Carlos Jr. He's 10-3, and three, and Uriah Primetime Hall is 14-9. and nine. Currently, they got Antonio Carlos Jr. minus 250. The comeback on Uriah Hall is plus 210. Well, Shaq, I know everyone remembers when we successfully faded Antonio Carlos Jr. at big dog odds against Ian Heinish. Well, now he takes on one of the best comeback finishers in the history of the sport in Uriah Hall, who is historically known for taking that ass whooping up front. And you start to gas out on a guy like Uriah Hall. And uh, it might be a spin kick to the face. It might be an overhand right. You might wake up looking up at the lights. They might need to bring in the smelling salts. Do you think Uriah Hall training at Fortis MMA for this camp will aid him to a big upset victory here? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting matchup. And I look at this fight from two different perspectives. Betting perspective, I would never bet Carlos Jr. out of line like this because, in my opinion, Carlos Jr. is a one-trick pony. You know what I'm saying? I feel like Carlos Jr. is one of the more overrated middleweights that is in the top uh, 16. 16 in the world. He's one of the more overrated uh, middleweights uh, in the top 20. I feel like this guy's the definition of a one-trick pony. Now, he thinks he's a good boxer, and he's coming out here, and he's overwhelming guys like Jack Marshman, who are on their way out on the verge of uh, being cut from the promotion, and Tim Bosch, who only fights once a year and has been submitted a hundred times, and uh, Eric Spicely, who I don't even need to say that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, like beat, a, you beat my boy Marvin Vittori. And he beat a 21-year-old Marvin Vittori in a, a fight in which uh, and there was moments in that fight as well where um, Vittori almost finished uh, my boy Carlos Jr. there, but he was able to uh, out-grapple him. But I feel like Carlos Jr. is the definition of a one-trick pony. His last fight with Ian Heinish, look, Ian Heinish had been submitted by Black Belts before. Ian Heinish put himself, you know, Ian Heinish kind of made that fight, after watching it again, kind of made that fight harder than what he needed to make it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there were times where he was, you know, flipping into... <laughs> Flipping on the mat and just uh, getting swept, and we know the deal here. Carlos Jr. There's a very there's a chance he comes out here and gets his first round submission. But what 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 if he doesn't get that first round submission? You don't think Uriah Hall and Fortis MMA have been uh, preparing extensively weeks and weeks, uh, knowing that this guy's gonna try to shoot him? But what does Carlos Jr. have as a as a, as a fallback plan? You know what I'm saying? If uh, if he can't get the submission, so I feel like Carlos Jr. is a submission or a bust type of fighter, and uh, so I feel like the value is on Uriah Hall in this spot. Now Uriah Hall's got nine losses, and he's up and down. He's all over the place, 100. percent But Alicia got two to one. At least uh, Uriah Hall, he you know. Uh, and, and just in, in my opinion, he's been in a much higher, higher level fights. Now, granted, those fights, you know, he's been getting his ass whooped in some of those fights, but he ain't been fighting no Tim Boches and no and no Jack Marshmans. He's been fighting the Derek Brunsons, Musasis, Jocko's, Paulo Casas, and then he finished their uh, top Robert Whitaker. You know, this is a. I feel like this is a step down for Uriah Hall, and I feel like this is a fight where if he can clear his jiu-jitsu storm, he's gonna get confident really, really easily against this guy, Carlos. Jr. Carlos Jr. don't like getting hit, and he's got a very, very questionable chin. Just ask Dan Kelly. So, uh, you know, I feel like uh, Uriah Hall, this line was a little closer, like, to where it opened at, like, where it, where at earlier when he was plus 125, plus 145, then I'd be like, mm, Carl, I'd probably pick Carlos Jr., but the fact that everyone's on him like this, and I'm telling you right now, don't be shocked when Carlos Jr.'s out unconscious on that mat in the, sec early in the second round. I feel like, basically, he's going to come out here and, and probably really strain to get him down, and maybe he does, but let's not forget, Hall's never been submitted. He's been smashed by punches, but he... No one's ever actually made him, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, Carlos Jr. is going to have to be the first one to do that. He's got all the skills, but if that doesn't happen, the value's on Hall here, and I think that's what happens. I think uh, a safe Sayud and the Fortis team, you know, I feel like they're going to prepare Hall. I feel like he's probably just been sketchy in his preparation in a lot of these fights, and, and in a lot of these fights, Carlos Jr. ain't capable of any of these things that <laughs> the guys that uh, uh, Hall's been fighting, so... I'm going to go with Hall here in an upset. I think that Carlos Jr. is going to come out for three minutes, but I feel like uh, Hall's eventually going to get back up and knock him out. Yeah, you know, Carlos Jr. is a very uh, suspect guy if he can't submit you in that first round. And historically speaking, Uriah Hall, what he's most known for is coming back in that second or third round and getting devastating knockout finishes. So if he don't get submitted here in this first round, I'm very, very intrigued to see how it plays out, especially if Carlos Jr. is coming out here and just working extremely hard to get that first takedown, get that submission finish, and it doesn't materialize, man, I can't wait to see what happens if that's the case. But that being said, 
I've seen your eye hall get taken down too many times. I've seen him get his back taken by guys who are nowhere near the level of jujitsu of Antonio Carlos Jr. And that just leads me to believe that either this will be his first submission loss, even though we talk about the one trick pony and you're 100% right. I still think that when he's on the mat, if the submissions aren't working, I mean, he can punch too. He, he can get a ground and pound TKO as well. And then as far as the decision is concerned, so first round, Antonio Carlos Jr. is probably going to win. All he needs to do after that is get one more takedown and not let the guy back up to seal off two rounds for a decision. So I do think there's going to come a better time to fade Carlos Jr. again, and I will be right there waiting. You know what I'm saying? Ian Heinish was out there with those Granby rolls. I don't think your eye hall is going to be on that. But we'll see, man. He's a very athletic guy. He's a very talented guy. Now he's training at a great camp. Maybe maybe this is finally going to be the your eye hall we've been waiting for since the Ultimate Fighter. But... At the end of the day, I'm still going to go with the favorite here. I'm going to go with Carlos Jr. I think his jiu-jitsu is too dominant for Uriah Hall. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Michel Domolidor Pereira. He's 23-9. and nine, And Tristan Connolly is 13-6. and six. Currently, they got Michel Pereira minus 650. The comeback on Tristan Connolly is plus 475. Well, Shaq... Talk about one of the most impressive UFC debuts we've ever seen. Michel Pereira went out there, put on a serious show, man. I mean, the guy is a showman in every sense of the word. Super exciting. I'm going to take this first. Look, Michel Pereira was initially supposed to fight Sergei Kondosko, who was a very tough and experienced Russian. Sergey had some alleged visa issues, couldn't make it to the fight, so they needed a local Canadian to come in and get flying, uh, <laughs> to get flying knee uh, highlight reel KO'd. So they called up my boy Tristan Connolly, who got finished by Shane Campbell not too long ago. And look, Tristan Connolly is a tough guy. He's a workmanlike fighter. Definitely earned his way to the company. But the thing about this fight, Shaq, is that you got a former 205-er in Michelle Pereira taking on a former 45-er in Tristan Connolly. The size difference is going to be huge here. And, you know, Tristan's been talking a lot. He's been saying that if he can clear this early storm and, you know, get past the quote-unquote bullshit you know, the spins, the flying knees, all that stuff. Then he can go out there and break him. He even went as far as to call Michelle Pereira a quitter. Now, we have seen Pereira get stopped before, but granted, it was at 185 pounds. It was at 205 pounds. It really seems like since he dropped to 70, man, this is the best version of him we've ever seen. And when you talk about a guy like Michelle Pereira, you're talking about a guy that'll, you know, you, you know that Showtime kick that Anthony Pettis did? Well, this guy takes it a step further. He'll do somersaults off the cage, whether it's the ground and pound, whether it's the... The Superman punches. Uh, the guy is truly a phenom to watch. And I'm very excited to see what kind of show he puts on here. And, you know, eventually down the line when we got someone really durable, someone that's actually a welterweight that can clear that early storm and then put it on him late, you know, we'll take that dog shot. But here against Tristan Connolly, man, I got Michelle Pereira via flying somersault head kick KO. Tristan Connolly, yeah, tough guy, but he's coming here on short notice. Doesn't, didn't really have uh, much of a training camp. Now he's fighting Pereira. This is a much better fight for uh, Pereira than Kondosko. Not saying he was going to lose, but Kondosko is actually 30 some fights in Russia, 27 and 5 or whatever it was. And uh, Tristan Connolly hasn't been fighting on that level. You know what I'm saying? He's been fighting. Uh, on the Canadian scene, you know, it seems like he's got a good pace, and I will say Pereira, I can't see that flaw where if you can clear all his spins and his jump things, I mean, those those, those things and jumping off the cage take a lot of energy, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> doing flips in the in the middle of the rounds, but I think it's going to work against this guy, I think he starches this guy, you know, fairly quick with a, a flying knee or a, and a followed by a straight, kind of similar to a hot chocolate, so I got Macho Pereira by first round uh, knockout. Next up in the heavyweight division, we got the return of Todd Duffy. He's 9-3, and, and Jeff Hughes is 10-2. and two. Currently, they got Jeff Hughes minus 125. The comeback on Todd Duffy is plus 105. Well, Shaq, initially, it was Todd Duffy who opened a minus 170 favorite. This line is flipped. Now you got Jeff Hughes, the favorite. And what's interesting about this fight is that Todd Duffy at one point, you know, a lot of people were saying, because you, you see the guy's physique, you see some of his knockouts, they were saying, man, this is a heavyweight that you need to look out for. I know you remember that Tim Haig fight, knocked him out right away. Then he fought Mike Russo. He was a huge favorite. We all thought, oh, man, he's going to run through this guy real quick. And then uh, you remember one of the biggest upsets of that year when he was knocked out and then had the little boop as a follow-up uh, shortly after. So, you know, Todd Duffy hasn't quite materialized, and now he's coming off another long layoff, trying to make it back here. So he's always going to have the physical attributes. He's always going to be a, a strong and athletic guy. It's just about where's his mindset at, where's his chin at. And since the last time that Todd Duffy has fought, 
Jeff Hughes has actually fought close to nine times. So Jeff Hughes has been out here putting in work. He's been staying consistent. It's just that, you know, when you talk about Jeff Hughes, you know, he kind of is a bit of a fat guy. And uh, Todd Duffy has a history of starching fat guys. He also has a history of getting starched by fat guys. Don't forget about that Mike Russo fight. I got to bring that up again. So I got to favor the, the activity here of Jeff Hughes. He's actually been fighting. We don't know where Todd Duffy's mindset is at. Uh, apparently, Khabib and his brother convinced Todd Duffy to, to step back in there. Todd Duffy's been doing this camp at AKA, which is a good thing. But he, he's one of those hit or miss fighters where you just don't know what to expect. I mean... Is it going to surprise me if he starts this Hughes in the first round? No, he is a heavyweight. He is powerful. He's a real athlete. Jeff Hughes is a fat guy. <laughs> but uh, I think that if this gets past the first round, uh, the momentum is going to shift in Jeff Hughes' favor. I think he takes over. I think he wins the next two rounds. Potentially knocks Todd Duffy out, honestly, man. So I'm going Jeff Hughes here, the former LFA heavyweight champion, to get another UFC victory. Actually, to get his first UFC victory. Todd Duffy's coming back off their uh, four-year layoff in which he – got uh knocked out by frank mirren i feel like this is uh these guys are complete role reversals here you know you got todd duffy the big muscly man but then you got jeff hughes the the you know the big fat guy but in terms of skills one guy is way better than the other one i mean todd duffy throws punches like a girl I mean, <laughs> and that's just the way to put it yeah granted he's uh knocked out some guys but who hasn't knocked out anthony hamilton you know what i'm saying who uh who hasn't knocked out phil defreeze you know what i'm saying tim Hague, you know what i'm saying he's fought a bunch of guys i feel like jeff hughes you know fast forward four years all this time in between kind of similar to his opponent frank mir who uh knocked him out who came back off a big layoff to come lose to a big fat guy named Javi Ayala <laughs> so you know I feel like Todd Duffy I've been hearing some interviews uh this week the guy he low-key sounds completely out of it he's using his time to talk about Greg Hardy and and we know what happens <laughs> when they start talking about Greg Hardy he's talking about I want to fight Hardy this and that after this to be honest he sounded like the white Juan Adams <laughs> and you know what I'm saying so I feel like Todd, uh, Jeff Hughes has a big advantage in the boxing department it's just a matter of he has to this guy Todd Duffy is just used to coming down here and throwing a bunch of shitty punches and these big fat guys just falling down and four years later can you do that the Anthony Hamilton knockout I mean Daniel Spitz knocked that guy out in less than a minute so and Adam shit Vicharek beat that guy so like big fucking whoop like <laughs> Jeff Hughes at least went three rounds with a uh, a young now heavyweight in Maurice Green in which you know he just he already beat the guy pr like a few months prior to that I feel like that fight was just a bad situation for Jeff like why would you fight a guy that you already beat literally months ago <laughs> in a five rounder I guess he didn't have a choice I feel like this is a much better fight for him I feel like Todd Duffy is kind of sounding deranged and uh I just listened to w some of the shit he just said so <laughs> I think uh, t uh, Jeff Hughes is going to come out here. Todd Duffy's probably going to try to walk him down and overwhelm him with violence, but I think it'll all it take will one will just be one little counter shot on Todd Duffy's uh, chin, and he'll be asleep, and he can go complain about Greg Hardy and do all this uh, other shit. Whenever they start talking about Greg <laughs> Hardy, you know they're getting ready to pull a massive stunt, so just don't be surprised here if it's another uh, highlight reel knockout against Todd Duffy in this spot, man. You got you to gotta stop talking about Greg Hardy. You got to focus on the task at hand, my man. Co-main event of the evening in the light heavyweight division. We got Glover Teixeira. He's 29-7. and seven, And Nikita Krylov is 26-6. and six. Currently, they got Glover Teixeira minus 115. And Nikita Krylov is minus 105. So Shaq gets a pick em with a slight lean on Glover Teixeira. Now, a lot of people are saying it's striker versus grappler. That, you know, if this day is standing, Nikita has the edge. If this hits the mat, Glover is going to win. So... Now, I, I got to know, man, do you think Nikita made the proper adjustments and improvements necessary to overcome a stylistic matchup that has historically given problems? For a very long time throughout his career this is an interesting fight you know people saying nikita is making improvements and you know i, I don't want to say i completely disagree but i mean i disagree you know <laughs> i think he basically got blessed with a uh aging old man by the name of Ovin saint prue that you know is completely done and <sighs> I, I wish OSP the best of luck because he is in he is in big big trouble <laughs> coming up here soon. But uh, he still got fully mounted by the guy. You know what I'm saying? He still uh, it was just OSP got he let him back up and quit. <laughs> um, he's been 
getting finished in pretty much all his fights. Now, I'm not going to necessarily hold that against Nikita, you know what I'm saying? Uh, this is the type of fighter he is. Sometimes Nikita will be on top, and then the next minute he'll go for a sub and be on his back. I mean, he is the definition of a kill-or-be-killed fighter. I feel like this fight is pretty much cut and dry. I feel like, is Nikita, because, I mean, let's be honest, on the feet, it, it might be a mismatch. I mean, Nikita, with them kicks at range against a guy like Glover, I mean, one of those you know, one of those uh, feet get behind his ear. I mean, Glover is going to probably do a chicken dance i mean he's been doing a chicken dance and and how many fights in a row now you know what i'm saying so like uh and he's been on the verge on the brink of you know getting finished multiple times and he keeps coming back because these guys don't have composure now nikita really hasn't shown uh I guess you can say he took a, a step up in his composure, and the composure side of things his last fight, because who knows, in the past he might have, you know, just uh, done what he did against OSP the first time, you know, get tapped out, but I think that, uh, I'm gonna go with the young guy, I'm gonna go with Nikita by first round KO, man, I got a feeling that Glover Teixeira, I feel, I do feel like if Glover gets on top of him, the fight will be over, Glover Teixeira, at least from a betting perspective, at least, you know, it, it's looking like it's uh, trending towards dog money now, so Nikita probably comes out here in, in one of those, uh, sh lands on his head or a knee or Glover tries to take him down and he does the Travis Brown uh, elbows on him and gets a knockout. It's a, it could be a tough fight, but I don't trust uh, Nikita enough on the mat. I mean, he still got fully mounted by OSP and very easily, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, But I'll pick him to win by knockout. I just don't think Glover's going to survive this time. Yeah, I mean, that's what it comes down to in my mind for real, man. Uh, Nikita Krylov, so it's interesting because he's had 31 pro fights and all 31 of them have ended inside the distance. This guy has never been to a decision before in his career. And he does get criticized for his submission defense, but, I mean, the guy's got a lot of submission wins as well. It's not like he doesn't know what he's doing on the mat. It's just that if you can get on top of him and pin him flat on his back, that's his weak spot. That's the bottom line. But it's not sitting here acting like he's on that Curtis Melender jiu-jitsu program or anything like that because Nikita will go out there and submit certain guys and he will take guys down. But when you're talking about a real jiu-jitsu black belt like Glover Teixeira, if I'm Nikita's corner, man, I ain't recommending you take this guy down or try to grapple with him. I'm recommending you try to stand at distance and knock this guy the fuck out. You know, use that Kyokushin karate, mix the hands to the kicks, be elusive out there, use that nice footwork, keep it standing the entire time, go out there and capitalize on a much slower and older aging opponent that uh, you have a speed advantage over. So if Nikita does that, I think he comes out here and gets the win. That being said, you noticed in Glover's last three wins that, you know, shit was going kind of shaky on the feet, but as soon as those fights hit the mat one time, Shaq, they were over shortly after. We were in attendance in April at UFC 236 when Nikita Krylov fought Ovint St. Pru. First fight on the main card. I even bet on Nikita Krylov at dog money. And first round, he goes out there, gets taken down, gets full mounted. I was like, oh my God, Nikita. And luckily, O Vince was just like, you know what? I'm going to let you back up. I'd seriously doubt that if Glover gets a full mount or a back mount on Nikita Krylov, that he's just going to let him back up. I think that if he gets there, the fight will be over shortly after. And I think that as long as he survives this early storm, he does get the fight down and he does finish it shortly after. So I'm going to go with Glover Teixeira via submission, but it's extremely 100% contingent on him getting this fight down to the mat. But I do think he only needs one good takedown to finish this fight. So I'm going to go Glover Teixeira via submission. Main event of the evening in the lightweight division. You got Donald Cowboy Cerrone. He's 36-12. and 12, And Justin the Highlight Gaethje is 20-2. and 2. Currently, they got Justin Gaethje minus 190. The comeback on Cowboy Cerrone is plus 165. Shaq, this is an unbelievable fight. Uh, two of the most exciting fighters in the history of the sport, not just the lightweight division. Do you think it's going to be a first-round finish, or do you think it's going to be an all-time war? And that's the big question here, man, because I would lean with a first-round finish favors Justin Gaethje here because we have noticed, historically speaking, Cowboy Cerrone is a slow starter. And he has been stopped in the first round five to six times. So Gaethje starts out extremely fast every time. He can definitely go out there and capitalize on the tall man's defense of Cowboy Cerrone. And I also know the last tall man, to call him Homer Simpson, Gaethje didn't really like that very much. And he knocked the guy out. Is he going to do that here? That's the big question. But one thing I got to say is if this fight is extended, not that Gaethje can't go out there and win, but I do think the odds and maybe the momentum significantly shift towards Donald's favor if this fight goes past the first round because he's got all that five-round experience. Not that Gaethje doesn't, but we have noticed in these fights that actually turn into real wars in the UFC, Gaethje got knocked out in both of them. Now, someone could counter me and say, well, what about the Michael Johnson fight? And you're 100% right about that. 
But I kind of didn't really consider that a back and forth war. I kind of considered that a one sided ass whooping. But Gaethje was, you know, so confident, was beating this guy down. He left his chin in the air. He got wobbled twice in the fight. But aside from those two wobbles, it's not like Michael Johnson was controlling any parts of that fight, was winning any rounds, or doing anything like that. It was basically Gaethje whooped his ass, got caught twice, and went out there and finished the guy. Whereas his fights with Dustin Poirier. I mean, Dustin was actually out there winning rounds against Gaethje, which no one's ever done before. The fight with Eddie, uh, you could you could classify that as a stunt a little bit. You know, Justin Gaethje was winning that entire fight until he got knocked out in that third round. It seemed like the decision was about to go his way. He made a big mistake. I caught with that knee. But his next fight against Poria, he lost fair and square. There's no, you know, he was losing rounds in that fight. If that would have went to a, de a decision, Poria would have probably got it. But, you know, Poria knocked him out instead. But since that point, now I feel like Gaethje's really getting comfortable inside the octagon. You saw those two first-round knockouts, vicious ones against Vic and Barboza. Now he's got a chance to do that against the Cowboys. So, again, I'm going to get back to my point, man. I really think that if this fight ends in the first round, that's favoring Gaethje 100%. But the longer this fight goes, Cowboy has a way of settling into these fights. And once he starts feeling confident, once he's got your range, he lets go off on some big combinations the punches the kicks the knees the elbows obviously he's so well-rounded you take this guy down he's going to submit you off his back but i don't think gaethje's going to use his d1 wrestling he never uses his d1 wrestling unless it's in reverse if someone tries to take him down he's going to keep this fight standing stand and bang until one man falls i think that's exactly what's going to happen i love the cowboy i think the longer this fight goes the odds shift in his favor but i don't think the fight goes that long and then gaethje goes out there pressures him lands the big shot the kill blow and knocks him out. But at the betting window, I'm still not trying to lay almost 2-1 to one against Cowboy Cerrone. I, I still think he's he's a dog, man. The guy's got a lot of fight in him. He's one of the best in the world. Has been his entire career. So I would need better odds to bet against him. But the pick is Gaethje here. Cowboy Cerrone, he's coming in off the Ferguson fight. And, you know, where that eye got closed up. And his career, uh, in terms of guys who he's fighting, is, is pretty much simple. Is the guy top five or not? You know, if he's top five, then he's going to beat Cowboy. If he's... Uh, Alex Hernandez or an ally of Kenta or, you know, uh, a uh, Yancey Madero, some Mike Perry, non-top five guys, then he's going to whip your ass. But if you are in that top five, then you'll probably beat him and beat him very soundly. So that's been the case his entire career. So the big question is, is Justin Gaethje really top five or not? Now he's coming off these two wins against Vic, who, you know, was number, I'm sure he's top 10 at the time. It's in Barbosa. And, and to, you know, I'll tell you what, to finish Edson like that, man, is it, very impressive, you know, after seeing his fight with Paul. I'm not saying that Paul and Justin are, uh, but just the fact that he put that guy down, man, less than uh, less than two minutes, right? It's uh, very impressive. So, you know, Cerrone, like you said, uh, seems like when he settles in that uh, these that these guys can't keep up. And, you know, I just feel like a lot of that reasoning is because those guys went into the fights with bad mindsets. Alexander Hernandez, I mean, that kid was saying all type of stupid shit and fucking uh, Ally Akinto, uh, uh, you know, doing the same as well. Now, Justin Gaethje is such a, is such a different type of guy, man. He's a truly, a truly one-of-a-kind type of fighter. This guy doesn't give a shit about getting knocked out. You know, he wants to either go to sleep or put you to sleep. And I feel like when you when you got a mindset like that against a guy like a guy like Cowboy, it's a good recipe for a first-round finish. You know, Gaethje's going to come out here, put the pressure on him with the calf kicks, and throw big punches. Now, we've seen Cowboy Cerrone in the past get overwhelmed against guys like Darren Till with the power or Rafael Dos Anjos with the power, not necessarily to the point where he's been knocked out stiff, but he has been finished. Anthony Pettis, things like that but it's just a matter Justin Gaethje is clearly different than guys that the guys that Cerrone's been beating lately Cerrone beats guys that are just average or barely in the top 15 you know what I'm saying I I feel like Justin Gaethje has proven that he's a top five fighter you know although he did get knocked out by Eddie and Dustin two former world champions now uh Cerrone beat Eddie before as well the thing is I think uh Justin Gaethje uh his fight with Dustin Poirier although he did get knocked out in the fourth round it was one of those losses where I gave him a lot of stock man you know I feel like there's no shame in getting knocked out by a guy like Dustin Poirier Dustin Poirier had the most finishes at featherweight when he moved up and he's up there and by the time he's done at 55 he might have the most finishes at 55 man so Cerrone's got a similar similar thing but I just feel like uh, this is a good fight for Justin Gaethje I feel like Cowboys pushing it a little bit uh at this age you know coming back so soon after the ferguson fight but hey this is what cowboy does he likes to get paid but i got justin gaethje by first round knockout i think he puts the pressure on him with the calf kicks and i, I think he forces cerrone to almost kind of sell out and kind of fight his fight with those calf kicks i think he might be the best calf kicker in the game now, i know cerrone's got the muay thai background but 
I mean, when this guy's out here landing flush calf kicks on guys like Edson Barbosa, <laughs> and I'm just like, man, how can you deny that? So I think he's learned his lessons from those two losses, and he's come back to... I remember after he lost to Dustin, and if you watch his post-fight interview, he was crying, and he was, you know, saying that he only had a couple more fights left and this and that, but man, he bounced back good, and uh, I think he does the same here. And I think he puts himself in a position uh, one fight away from a title, so... Justin Gaethje uh, by first round knockout. Or if the win is exciting enough, uh, maybe McGregor will want to come out of retirement, come out of that coke binge, and uh, yeah. bless one of these guys with that big money <laughs> fight, right? Bless my boy Dustin. <laughs> Change our life. So we just want to thank everyone that listens to Half the Battle. Make sure you go to bestfightpicks.com and use that promo code MATADOR to save 15% off any VIP package. And now we got to hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Kyle, it's going down this Saturday in Vancouver. Two of the most exciting lightweights of all time. How's it going? It's going great, man. I cannot wait for this fight. Gaethje, Cerrone, neither one of them have ever had a boring fight, so we know we're going to have fireworks. If your book offers fight of the night, just go ahead and lock it in. Man, I'm really interested to hear your take on this one because both guys have come through for you big this year alone at Dog Money. And interestingly enough, in this fight, you got Justin Gaethje. He's 9,000 on DraftKings. Cerrone's 7,200. Obviously, I need to know your perspective on the fight, but who do you think is going to be the more popular play here? I think Gaethje will be the more popular play. Uh, just his style alone, there's no way he doesn't score high when he wins. And from what I've seen, most people are picking him this weekend. So he's, he's a lock to pay off 9K and a win, and I think he'll be probably the most owned guy on the card. Uh, but I'm going to have – man – I don't know if I'm going to be able to go as high on that because I like Cerrone in this fight. If he can get out of the first round, I think he's very live here. And if he can drag this into the you know the championship rounds, I think he's going to end up winning the fight in those rounds. So I'm going to be closer to 50-50 on this one. I am picking Cerrone to win this, but, but man, it, it's hard to really pick against Gaethje and that first round is going to be a big-time sweat. <clears throat> and like I said, if Gaethje wins, He's going to score like 100 plus, 120 plus, something like that. So you have to be targeting Gaethje as well. But if the field's going to be, you know, 60 30 on this, I'd rather be, you know, 50 50 or, or even 60 40 on Cerrone just because I think he's a little bit more alive than the field does. And if he wins, he's for sure paying off his $7,200 price tag. So it's an all in fight. Every one of my lineups is going to have this. I'll stack it in cash. Um, but I'm going to be pulling for the underdog. So let's go, Cerrone. Now, Kyle, on the co-main event in the evening, you got Krilov taking on Teixeira. Obviously, you already know that all 31 of Krilov's pro fights have ended inside the distance. I don't think this fight is going to be an exception. Uh, my question here is, obviously, you know I'm a betting man, but now I'm learning the DraftKings terminology. Would you agree with me when I say that both these guys have a high ceiling and a low floor? Yeah, no doubt. That's, that's as correct as you can get. It's another all-in fight for GPPs for me. Uh, the co-main and the main... Just have every one of your lineups include this fight because I have a hard time seeing the winner of the 20K this weekend or the 25K this weekend not have the winner of these two fights in their lineup. So I'll be all in in my GPPs. Um, and, man, I've kind of gone back and forth on this one. Uh, I think Krylov's got the higher ceiling because he can get the knockout in the first round and then however many strikes he gets along with that. So he has 100-plus upside here. But with Teixeira, I think if he's going to win, it's it's more probably taking Krylov down and then submitting him. And if that's the first round, we're hoping to get like 100 points max because we're not going to get those knockdown points. Uh, but at 7,700, we don't really need, you know, 120 points from him either. So a first round would be fine with me with Teixeira. I think that's very live. Uh, but I'll be I'll be splitting up my action on this. Maybe, maybe 60-40, 50-50 again. Uh, and I like – right now I'm leaning with Teixeira, but – it's a close one. I might end up changing my mind uh, after weigh-ins or even before the fight. I don't know. It's so close. Uh, and Texture being 39, that scares me. So it's going to be a sweat, but uh, it's going to be in every one of my lineups for GPPs. I think you can fade this in cash if you want because, like you said, they do have low floors. You don't really want to have a zero from either guy in your cash lineup. So next up, you got a heavyweight bout between Jeff Hughes and Todd Duffy and uh, – Man, I don't know if you heard Todd Duffy's recent interview, but it looks like he's getting ready to pull a massive stun. Uh, my boy Shaq even called him the White Juan Adams. So I got to know, man, uh, are you willing to give Jeff Hughes another chance here? Man, I, I mean, you kind of have to in this fight. 
it's it's another one where this main card is really going to be important for DraftKings. Uh, like we got the fight doesn't go to decision is minus 300 on this one. And their DraftKings prices are right there in the mid range. So the winner's going to end up outpaying that salary. So I think you have to target this fight, even though I'm not confident in either side, it's going to be another, you know, close to all in fight because if Duffy wins, it's probably a first round knockout. Uh, and if Hughes wins, I think it's probably a second or third round knockout. So either way, they're going to score highly. And I, I don't, feel confident in either one so i won't be touching this fight in cash right now I, i'm leaning hughes i think he probably finishes up some in you know the second round maybe early third round and i don't know if he has 100 plus point upside with that but at 8300 i don't think we really need it so i'm gonna have a good amount of this fight uh and i'm leaning towards hughes so we got the return of Mitchell Pereira. I know you remember that UFC debut against Danny Hot Chocolate. He's taking on the newcomer Tristan Connolly. Now, Tristan said that he's going to clear that first round storm. He's going to break him late. Do you buy that or do you think Michelle Pereira is going to come out here and cover that 9,500? Yeah, I have a hard time seeing Connolly weather the storm really. I mean, he's just going to be a, a way smaller guy and Pereira's going to be throwing everything he has at him. So I think he's going to end up finding a knockout. Uh, maybe another highlight reel one as well. So I, I think he's fine at 9,500 because if he is going to win, it's probably early. It's probably a first-run knockout, and that's going to be, you know, 100-plus points. So I'm definitely cool with targeting him uh, in all formats, but I think he's a better GPP play because, you know, you're shooting for the boom or bust there, whereas if he does weather that storm and somehow beats Pereira, if you paid 9,500 for Pereira in your cash lineup, you're probably not going to win cash this week. So – um, it's a little riskier there, but I, I think the UFC is just feeding this guy to him, and I see a first-round knockout coming. So I like him here, and I, I don't know if I, I want any Conley at all. And Kyle, last but not least, you got Antonio Carlos Jr. taking on Uriah Hall. I mean, this is the classic striker versus grappler. Uh, we've seen in the past, if you can clear that early storm from Antonio Carlos Jr., guys can break him late, and Uriah Hall has a knack for the comeback win. Do you see the underdog coming through here? I mean, I see paths to it happening, and if if he can even stuff takedowns, he can knock out uh, Carlos Jr. in the first round. Like, I don't think the striking is really close at all in this fight. However, I am going to go with ACJ because I think he's just going to be consistently going for takedowns, and if he can get them and get top control, he can get a finish in the first or second round, which is what we're going to need at 9,100. I mean, a third-round submission from him is probably not going to cut it, a decision might not cut it unless he's getting, you know, a bunch of takedowns and advances during it. Um, so at that price tag, I'm hoping for a first or second round submission. And I think he's definitely got it in his game. So I like him as my pick here. But like you said, man, if Hall can survive that, I think he's going to end up coming back and either win this fight or get a knockout himself second, third round. So I'm not going to be fading Hall. Uh, and if I'm going to end up being heavy at all on ACJ, I'd for sure want some Hall hedge lineups because he's a way more dangerous striker. And if he got a knockout in the first round, it wouldn't shock me at all. If that happens, he's going to be on that 25K lineup. Well, Kyle, that's why you are the DraftKings guy for half the battle. It's going down this Saturday in Vancouver. They can follow you at Big Marley 3. Your bets and your write-ups are available at bestfightpicks.com. Yes, sir. Got two plays ready. Uh, just finished up my DraftKings write-up. Got about 16 and a half. A uh, thousand words up in there, so it'll keep you busy. It'll give you a lot of info. It's only eight bucks. Check it out. And let's make some money this weekend. Good luck, everybody. Well, Shaq, let's go ahead and answer these fan questions. Uh, thank you guys all for submitting these fan questions. Really appreciate it. So Dane Downey Jr. wants to know, what did you think about Dustin's performance? Leg kicks, question mark, waiting to counter, exposing neck to look at your corner with an animal on your back. Maybe I'm wrong. Thoughts? Uh, I mean, my opinion is that Khabib is just the best lightweight on planet Earth. That pressure is too much. Uh, that it wasn't even a matter of, you know, what Dustin could have done or this or that. It was just wrong place, wrong time, bad matchup. Dustin wasn't going to win that fight, um, unfortunately. We were all rooting for him. He's one of my all-time favorite fighters. But Khabib right now, at this point in time, is the best lightweight on planet Earth. And you know, we can talk about what kind of adjustments Dustin should have done, but the bottom line is Dustin had one of his Dustin Poirier flurries on him. Dustin had a deep guillotine attempt. 
both weren't enough. And I don't think that it was simply a case of, you know, after you guys guillotine, then he exposed his back and let Khabib tap him out. I don't think it was like that at all, man. I think that when you put so much into that guillotine attempt and then you have nothing left, you're completely gassed. And he's like, <sighs> then you got the pressure of Khabib on top of you. And, you know, this wasn't like Connor who tapped out to a choke that wasn't even locked in. Like that Dustin Poirier Khabib choke, that was as in as it gets, man. There was no choice but to tap. He would have been unconscious two seconds later. So I really can't criticize poorest performance i think you just got to give credit to khabib there yeah in terms of taking damage i feel like dustin poirier took less damage compared to a lot of guys i mean there was not really any ground and pound from the heaven moments where you were like connor where there was a one whole round where it was like oh my god shit connor got dropped too <laughs> connor got dropped on the feet he got smashed on the mat and you know at least khabib and him and dustin were on the feet i mean khabib didn't even throw i mean just ankle diving the whole time because, hey, that's the right game plan. Dustin's not a wrestler, you know. There's going to be better matchups uh, when he fights guys with wrestling backgrounds. So I feel like Dustin, I mean, he just wasn't going to win that fight. Like you said, uh, Khabib's just a bad matchup for him, you know. Uh, that's why matchups make fights, you know. Maybe Gaethje, a guy that Poirier beat, matches be matches up better, you know. He's got the wrestling, yeah. right? So, you know, Dustin's not a wrestler. So uh, I feel like, yeah, it's more so that. I think his performance was fine. I mean, there was... He, it took relatively, like, I've seen Michael Johnson and Connor and Ayakinta, you know, those guys, you know. It they, took hella damage. It took hella damage, you know what I'm saying? And Khabib felt really confident standing with Connor. He didn't want to stand at all with Dustin. I don't blame him. So, yeah, man, no, no criticism here on Dustin's part. Brandon wants to know, should refs be the ones tasked with deducting points or should that be left to the judges to decide since they're the ones in charge of scoring the fight? No, 100% 100% refs, bro, because they're the ones in the cage directly in front of the action. They see what's going on, so I would not change that. Yeah, I agree. All right, Travis wants to know, fan question, what are the chances that Todd Duffy has reinvented himself and can now achieve the potential he looks like he has? Uh, I don't see it happening, man. I mean, he might be able to win this fight, maybe even win another fight, but even that, so that's a stretch. Uh, I think no matter what happens in this fight, Todd Duffy will not live up to the potential he has had. You know, I would say he could, but then when I hear these interviews of him coming back and he just looks so deranged and not on his steroids and talking about Greg Hardy, it sounds like a white version of Juan Adams. Almost, you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so a little bit of me is hoping he gets past this fight with Hugh so he can fight Greg. And so he can go out there and get his head smashed 50 times and complain early stoppage. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> good dog odds on it, too. <laughs> a part of me is hoping he comes out here and steamrolls uh, steam uh, Hughes. You know, I'm, look, I know Greg made some mistakes, but don't come in here trying to, like, single him out. Like, come on. Like, look, bro. even the... Like, like, you don't got no skeletons in your closet, bro? <laughs> like, come on. Like, where the fuck have you been these last few years? What have you been doing? But we don't give a fuck, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> I really could care less. <laughs> Oracle wants to know, how would you cap the over-under of spinning shit attempts for Pereira? I'm saying five and a half. Well, I'm thinking this fight ends in the first round. So I'm going to say, you said spin, just spinning shit or jumping shit too? He, he means all the flashy okay, shit. Okay, all the shit. So uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, yeah, four, you know, good four to five times, yeah. Travis wants to know who wins the Bellator Featherweight Tournament. Emmanuel or Matador Sanchez? Emmanuel. It's going to be a rematch of, my opinion, of um, um, Matador and Pitbull. You know, the, the better man will win. Yes, sir. Why hasn't Ponzi fought? Is oh, Edwards man. versus Ponzi the fight to make? So, we're on the street. Yeah, man, so, it's not looking good for Ponzi, bro. Man, <laughs> it sucks because he's such a great talent. But initially, it was a contract negotiation. But then he got really sick. And now, he's just trying to rehab, trying to get back to the man he was. Uh Word on, word on the street is he's trying to drop to 55s. <laughs> Man, uh, whatever hit Pons this year was some serious shit, so we just wish him the best. Hope the guy recovers. Because, um, man, the guy was such a talent at 70. I'd love to see him fight Tyron Woodley. Love to see him fight all these guys. It's a shame what happened. So Is it a bacterial infection yet? So we wish uh, Santiago Pons and Nibio all the best and hope he makes a full recovery ASAP. All right, now on our YouTube, we got a couple questions too. So Stelios Contos wants to know, should UFC have open scoring so you can see what each judge scores after each round? Mm. I mean, maybe. I mean, but it won't make a difference. It won't make a difference. Like, I mean, because then what happens when you think you won a round and you see a judge fucking score it the other <laughs> way and you're already fucking swimming? Just tell me after. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think 
what we need to focus on more is the quality of judges than this kind of other stuff that no we need to focus on the quality of judges instead my boy Rocco wants to know so how do you boys enjoy to watch the fights snacks drinks how do you find how do you go about finding good picks what did you, okay let's answer each question first so how do you boys enjoy to watch the fights on the big screen with steak and uh, herbal remedies how do you go about finding good picks just put the work in. How did you guys first get into MMA? First time we saw it, we fell in love. Favorite fighters, you just can't miss when they fight. Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje. Thanks for all the great content and work. Haters be jealous. Thank you very much, my man. Really appreciate your support. Do you believe the Gaethje's infection on his eye can influence the odds? Yeah, of course. All that kind of shit can influence the odds because people put so much stock in the Oh, now he's not focused. Oh, now he's injured. Now he's this. Now he's that. So I mean, it already is influencing the odds. So he got ten cents better last night. So yeah, I think it can influence can influence the odds for sure. Yeah, I mean, will it? Does people, that people put stock in anything, man? People put stock in that. Is Sakai a lock? I mean, to sit here and say something is a lock. This is MMA. These are four ounce gloves. It's really tough to say. But, I got Sakai by first round knock. <laughs> but if they fight ten times, do I think Sakai wins at least eight of those? Yes, I do. Kubio MMA says, what's up, guys? I was wondering who's better on the ground, Krylov or Teixeira? Teixeira, he's a high-level jiu-jitsu black belt. If he gets on top of Krylov, the fight will be over shortly after. If Krylov gets on top of him, unless Teixeira's been badly rocked, I think Teixeira can hang on and work his way back up. Yeah, Teixeira's a third-degree black belt. Julian wants to know, should the winner of Cowboy Gaethje get the next shot after Tony? Yeah, they could, or once again, like we were talking about on the show, they could get that big money McGregor fight. So either way, the winner of this fight... A title shot versus Khabib and Tony winner or McGregor. Maybe even Poirier. I mean, I'm down to see Cowboy versus Poirier. That's a fight I've always wanted to see. So it's going to be in that top five mix 100%. Yeah, you know, if, if Gaethje wins, I, I see, yeah. Um, if Cerrone wins, you know, maybe. Uh, it's pretty much going to be between uh, – well, if Gaethje wins, then, you know, he's going to, you know, be in that conversation. Uh, man, it's pretty much – about what McGregor wants to do. Is he coming back or not, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but I definitely think uh, they'll be right up there for sure. So thank you guys so much for the questions. Really appreciate it. Love uh, adding this segment of the show, so we'll definitely do that next week as well. And Shaq, now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC Vancouver? My fight to watch is going to be... Jim Crew versus Misha Serkinov. Look, I think this is a fight where they're trying to get one side into the top 15. If Misha Serkinov can pull off this win, hey, you just be one of the top prospects. But if Jimmy Crew can get this one, 23 years old, and, and be in the top 15, like, a, you know, that 205 division's been changing, man. They're trying to get their guys in there, and uh, that's my fight to watch. Yeah, that's 100% one of the fights to watch. For me, my fight to watch is Glover Teixeira versus Nikita Krylov. Look, Nikita Krylov's numbers indicate that this fight has an 100% chance of ending inside the distance. And I truly believe that it will end before the final horn. And for that reason, it's going to be extremely violent. It's going to be chaos while it lasts. It's going to be a fight that you have to watch. Someone will go to sleep in this fight. So for that reason, Glover Teixeira versus Nikita Krylov is my fight to watch. Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC on ESPN plus 16. My fighter to watch is going to be uh, Todd Duffy. You know, I feel like uh, Todd Duffy's, you know, he's running his mouth. And he's my fighter to watch for the reasons of if he if he uh, wins, it's going to be probably a first round KO. So I'll probably jump out of my seat. But if he loses, it's going to be an epic stunt of where you're definitely talking about his stunt on Monday morning. I mean, you remember the mirror stunt? I mean, the, the Russell. Russell stunt. I mean, <laughs> the guys, when he loses, he's a major stunt puller. So he's one, he's one of the better stunt pullers uh, in the heavyweight's history. So, you know, Todd Duffy's my uh, fighter to watch. <laughs> Look, my fighter to watch is Mitchell Pereira. A lot of the fans don't know about him. He's only had one fight inside the octagon. But when you talk about excitement, when you talk about putting on a show, you're talking about Mitchell Pereira. Flying knees, spins, jumps off the cage somersaults backflips the whole bit i really think this guy's gonna go out there and not play it safe not hump someone's leg i think he's trying to put on a show every single time he fights and for that reason michelle Pereira is my fighter to watch well shack we did it it's going down this saturday in vancouver canada one of the most beautiful places uh, on planet earth a very nice place in vancouver especially during the winter Make sure you subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify. Follow Shaq at MMA Genius 05. Follow me at Best Fight Picks. Make sure y'all follow the IG Best Fight Picks official. 
and uh, Shaq underscore BFP. Interact with us any way you can. You know, we uh, definitely will respond. Make sure you guys go to bestfightbase.com. Use that promo code MATADOR to save 15% off any VIP package. With that 15% off, you can get a buy one, get one free uh, promotion that we're doing this weekend for UFC uh, Vancouver. So we got uh, a couple plays that we're going to have, and we plan on bringing home the win. So basically you're saying they get to save 15% off. And they get the next event free. My birthday's coming up, so I don't feel like uh, giving early so I can get some back. So make sure you take us up on that offer. Use the promo code MATTERDOR to save 15% off and then get the next event free as well. BestFightPicks.com for that. Again, follow me, Best Fight Picks. Follow Shaq, MMA Genius 05. Thank you all so much. We love you guys. Thank you for the support. Truly appreciate it. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.